This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform to succeed online. Beryllium's are unique oxonium-containing heterocycles, stabilized by aromaticity and their specific counter-ion. They are powerful and selective reagents for the activation of heterocyclic amines, and tolerate a wide variety of functional groups, making them more advantageous compared to predominant CN bond activation strategies, such as diazonium salts. As an example, after reacting a heterocyclic amine with beryllium, it forms the corresponding pyridinium salt and eliminates water. This can then be reacted with an oxygen, sulfur or nitrogen nucleophile and form the corresponding substituted product. Alternatively, you could simply add a chloride source, like magnesium chloride, and form the corresponding chlorinated product, which can be used to attach other functional groups. Other examples include installation of a hydroxyl or the fluorination of sulfonamides. These are all very handy transformations, especially for bioactive compounds. But beryllium is currently not used a lot, since it's quite expensive. Still, it can be made with some effort, and that's what I will do. But before we get into that, I would like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online, which I've been using to start setting up and building my own website and store. Because in the near future, I will have a special product sale with one of my videos. What I really enjoyed when starting out was that there were many flexible templates that are also just really nice from itself. So I only needed to customize them a little bit to fit my needs, and I quickly got what I needed, which saved me a lot of time. Besides that, their Fluid Engine design system allows you to be extra creative in building what you need, as well as extensions that allow you to use many third-party tools to extend the functionality of your website. So go to squarespace.com to try it out for free. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash cameolis to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So to get started with making the precursor, I set up a flask with a stir bar and add in 90 ml of water as a solvent. Then, 50.2 grams of potassium hydroxide as a base. I let it stir until everything has dissolved and then set it in a dry ice acetone bath to cool it down to minus 20 C. Now the starting material is the pyridine sulfur trioxide complex. Of that, I add 25 grams to the potassium hydroxide solution in about five portions, spaced over 25 minutes. When the addition is complete, I lightly put on a septum and let it stir for one hour at minus 20 C. I then let it stir for four hours at room temperature. Though when I came to look at it midway, it had become a very thick slurry that stopped stirring. That is not very helpful for the reaction. So I put in a big stir bar and set it in a heating block that I warmed slightly to about 30 C. I then see if I can loosen it with a spatula. It turned out that it is too thick, so I have to dilute it with water. I add water until it begins to stir again. I'm not sure if the added water will impact the reaction. It is now a red mixture, and I seal it with a septum again. I left this to stir at room temperature for 2 hours, and then at 40 C for 30 minutes. In this reaction, potassium hydroxide and water react with the pyridine SO3 complex, causing it to ring open and hydrolyze, forming this enolate aldehyde molecule and potassium sulfamate. How it works is that the hydroxide ion attacks the pyridine in the 2 position, causing the nitrogen carbon bond electrons to move onto the nitrogen to balance the charge that it had from bonding with the sulfur trioxide. Now it won't kick off sulfur trioxide, since that would disbalance its charge again. Instead, now that nitrogen is neutral, the sulfur also has to be neutral. So it will move one pair of bond electrons over sulfur oxygen bond onto the oxygen, forming a sulfamate type salt with the remaining potassium. The ring open product contains a hydroxyl that can be deprotonated by the potassium hydroxide. We could say that it forms the corresponding alkoxide, which it is, but because of the adjacent carbon-carbon double bond, we should call it an enolate. Then, the following intermediate can potentially be isolated, as it forms when a mixture is cold, but it only continues to the next reaction when it is heated. Because of the strongly basic conditions, we can't have a protonated intermediate. So the following reaction must take place all at once. So a hydroxide attacks the carbon of the amine, a pair of carbon-nitrogen bond electrons move onto the nitrogen, and at the same time, it deprotonates a water molecule, regenerating the hydroxide. Then in the next step, I will also consider this step to be concerted and contained within the molecule. But it would be more realistic if the hydroxide deprotonates the hydroxyl, giving the alkoxide. And then the reaction proceeds by protonation of the amine with water. Instead, I draw it as if the amine deprotonates the hydroxyl, of which the oxygen-hydrogen bond electrons move to form a carbonyl, kicking off the sulfamate part of the molecule. In the end, it doesn't matter how we draw it. The result is potassium sulfamate and the final product. And we have just saved the effort 
of drawing another step that doesn't matter. When I return, it has become black, which is what should happen, and I then cool it down to 0C in an ice bath for 30 minutes, so that all the product precipitates. I then set it up for filtration, to filter out the precipitate, and I wash it twice with ice cold acetone, and twice with methyl terbutyl ether. I let it dry on the filter for a few minutes, leaving behind a brown solid, that contains the product. I move all of it to this flask, and I pull a vacuum on it, to make sure that it is completely dry. The dry weight turned out to be 20.2 grams. Most of this material is just crap, and to remove that, I set up a large flask and put in all of the solid, along with the same stir bar from before, that still contains some residue. Now I add about 900 ml of methanol, which will dissolve the product, and then 2 grams of activated carbon, which will help remove impurities. I then reflux this mixture for 15 minutes. After that, I move all of it to a large beaker so that I can immediately reuse this flask. I then set up the cleaned flask in a heating mantle with a stir bar, and I attach the funnel plugged with cotton, and I put some sea light on top to make sure it filters out all the activated carbon. I then filter all of the mixture through, and we can see it is now a red solution. I continue this filtration on the side, so that the flask doesn't get too full, and I start distilling off the methanol. When most of it is gone, I add the rest that I filtered on the side, and continue the distillation up till there's only a small volume of methanol left. I then filter out the orange-red precipitate, and I wash it out and down, twice with acetone, and twice with MTBE. An orange residue is left on the filter, which is the product. I move it all to this dish, and the yield turned out to be 7.1 grams which is 32%. This is about half compared to the literature. Maybe it's because I had to add water to make it stir before. They also mention that the quality of the pyridine sulfur trioxide complex is important, and I use the technical grade, which also lowers the yield. Overall, it isn't too bad all things considered. Now that I have the precursor, I can move on with making the perillium. So, I add all of the product to this flask, add a septum, and I then cool it down to about minus 20C in an acetone bath with some dry ice. I then flush out the flask with nitrogen to remove the air. As a solvent, I add in 120 ml of anhydrous diethyl ether. I then just let it stir while I prepare the next reagent. For that, I add a second flask into the bath, and the reagent I will need is tetrafluoroboric acid diethyl ether complex. I bought it a while ago, but I haven't taken it out yet, so it's unboxing time. This is how it comes, and it's a really disgusting color that does not instill a sense of quality. So thank you Sigma for this ugly reagent with questionable purity. Though the little plastic bottle is very cute. So I take up 48 ml of tetrafluoroboric acid diethyl ether complex and inject it all into the second flask so that it is already cooled to minus 20 C before it is added to the other flask. When it has all been added, I just let it stir for a while to make sure that it is cold. I then take the cold HPF4 and remove the septum from both the flasks and at once dump in all of the HPF4. It's important that it is all added at once, so that there is a big excess of HBF4 present, which minimizes the amount of polymerization. I then put the septum back on, and let it stir for a few minutes. The mixture darkens quickly. I flush out the flask with nitrogen again, and I then let it stir at room temperature for 16 hours. In this reaction, the precursor reacts with two equivalents of tetrafluoroboric acid, to cyclize and then eliminate water, forming perillium tetrafluoroborate. How it works is that in this excess of acid, both the aldehyde and the enolate are protonated by the acid at the same time. The aldehyde forms an oxocarbenium that is attacked by the hydroxyl, forcing a pair of carbonyl bond electrons onto the oxygen, giving this cyclic product with a hydroxyl. This hydroxyl then takes up the proton from the oxonium, giving a neutral oxygen in the ring. Now that the hydroxyl is protonated, it makes a great leaving group. So, a free electron pair from the oxygen is pulled into the ring, and the water is kicked off. This makes the ring aromatic, and improves its stability, which also makes it more favorable to occur. In the end, giving perillium tetrafluoroborate. The counter ion, in this case tetrafluoroborate, is also important for stability. The stabilization results from both electron density transfer and covalent bonding, so not every counter ion is good enough to stabilize the perillium. When I return, it is a bit darker, and I then just remove the septum, and directly add 100 ml of anhydrous diethyl ether. I let that stir for 30 minutes, and I then move it to the dry ice acetone bath again, at minus 20 C. I wait for it to cool down, and then stop stirring, causing two phases to form, and the product to settle to the bottom as a slurry. It is very difficult to see the layers in the flask. I take up as much of the top ether layer as possible, without taking up any of the dark slurry. It is easily visible in the syringe or pipette. 
if the slurry is in there. So it's not too difficult even though you can't see the separation. To make it go faster, I just remove the septum and quickly pipette it all out with a regular graduated glass pipette and a pipette bulb. When that's done, I again add an hydrous ether. Let it stir at room temperature, then move it to the dry ice acetone bath and repeat the same procedure for a total of 3 times. This is basically washing it with diethyl ether to remove some impurities while minimizing contact with the air and prevents having to transfer the difficult slurry. After all of that, I allow it to come back to room temperature and then add in 400 ml of anhydrous acetonitrile as a solvent. This will dissolve the product, while the insoluble black polymeric impurity will stay suspended. To again minimize contact with the air, I will filter it using a slang filter. With this, you can simply attach it and then turn it upside down to filter it, while being able to control the vacuum and nitrogen flow in a closed system to prevent contact with the air. The product isn't ridiculously sensitive to air, but we don't want to pull air through it on the filter. So it's just to be careful, though it's not going to burst into flames. Now below the filter, I attach another flask, and then attach the whole apparatus on top of the flask with the product. I blow nitrogen through the setup for a while to remove most of the air. I then close both stopcocks, take the whole apparatus, and turn it upside down. And it then filters through the glass fit. This device says 250 ml, but that's just the volume of the chamber. Unless you want to constantly use the top stopcock to do something, it's not really relevant if it's overfilled. Now I just let it all filter through, and on the bottom, I pull a vacuum to make it go faster. I also occasionally filled the upper chamber with some nitrogen when the liquid level was low enough, just to force it down a bit. When it is all filtered through, the black polymeric impurity stays behind on the filter. I wash that once with some acetonitrile and then take off the apparatus. If the residue on the filter is dry enough, you can usually just tap it on the bench and most of it will fall down out of the filter. I cleaned out the filter immediately because I will need it again. Now for the next step, we can precipitate out the perillium. So under nitrogen flow, I gradually mix a total of 1 liter of anhydrous diethyl ether with the acetonitrile. Since the volume of the flask is too small for this, I ended up doing it in two separate portions. When all of the ether has been added, we see a bunch of solid has precipitated that settles to the bottom. Since it's such a large volume, I will just carefully decant off the majority of the liquid into this beaker before I filter it. I then do the same as before with the slank filter, and I turn it upside down to filter it. The solution is a dark red color and the perillium collects on the filter. I also filter through the other half and wash the residue once with ether. I then dry out the residue, both with a stream of nitrogen and then by pulling a vacuum. I tap it to make it fall down and I scraped off the rest with a spatula. I am then left with the perillium tetrafluoroborate as a brown solid, which is also brown in literature. It still contains some residual solvent, so I heat it very very slightly while pulling a vacuum to dry it out completely. In the end, I have 6.8 grams of perillium tetrafluoroborate, which is a yield of 77%, compared to the 91% in literature. I think that's alright, since my exclusion of air and water wasn't so perfect. In the literature, there's a picture where they recrystallized it to make it off-white, but it doesn't say with what solvent, so I would have, if they said how. Also, because it's quite expensive to make, I will save it for when it will actually be useful instead of testing it out in a random reaction. So that's how you can make beryllium. See ya.